Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I am uh, limping into the unofficial end of summer, but, you know, at least I made it. Um, last week got, got kind of heavy. Uh, it involved a drive up to Boston to moderate a biotech panel, then out to Cape Cod on Thursday morning from there, uh, Wellfleet uh, specifically, uh, to record with next week's guest. And that meant I had a six-hour drive home that afternoon into evening, which uh, walloped the living crap out of me. I just spent too much time by myself in a car, and um, it took me a while to recover from that mentally. Uh, physically, it was okay. But anyway, I turned around and recorded the following week's show in New York City on Saturday, so eh, I'm functional enough now. I mean, I got up at 3 a.m. with anxiety about this morning's virtual presentation I had to give to Pfizer, and then there was this federal agency I had to talk with in the the, the afternoon, and and there was the bear that Benny and I encountered on our morning walkies. But uh, anyway, Labor Day weekend is coming up. So let's say this is the last show of the summer and dive right into it. My guest this time is Dash Shaw, who has a mind-blowingly good new graphic novel out. It's called Blurry, B-L-U-R-R-Y. It's from New York Review Books Comics. Blurry is a... It's a strangely disconcerting book, and it's one that I just enjoyed tremendously. Dash uses these these nested narratives, each story you know giving way to the next, with each with like one person's flashback leading to the story where another person uh, uh, that another person told them, and and so on, and then begins to snap back into our our subjective present. And the, the threads of a bunch of those stories begin to, to come together. And each of the stories, um, well, they take you into, into what the National called uh, the unmagnificent lives of adults, if you're a middle-aged man like me and listen to dad rock like that. Um, the events, the stories are, for the most part, kind of seemingly mundane, but they're also filled with these these turning points that seem to that seem to guide our lives more than the major decisions that we make do if you get me i'm being vague and i don't want to go into descriptions of the characters and the storylines that that ensue i want you i want you to pick up blurry i want you to read it and i want it to unfold for you the way it did for me um there's an whole array of characters and the the way dash brings it all together it's it is a remarkable book i'll I'll say one of the strange attractions of it all is that virtually every page is a two by two grid of identical size panels and that regularity is sort of sort of hypnotic he can't do anything with pacing that involves changing panel shapes everything has to fit into that geometry but the drawings, the 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 storytelling, it all, it all works, and again, it's sort of hypnotic. You find yourself being drawn in, and and complementing that are Dash's uh, clear line artwork and the the, the washes that he uses uh, for for tones, and he he brings us these epiphanies and and frustrations in these characters' lives and some kind of amazing comic uh, comic book graphic uh, effects to to go along with the the sort of conversational style of the the whole book and I'm just awed in terms of how he made it all work and as we discuss in the conversation that two by two structure well it it enabled him to take a more plastic approach to storytelling we'll we'll get into that 
Blurry is just an amazing graphic novel, almost impossible to put down, even as a near 500 page hardcover. Um, go get it. It's, it's really good. Blurry by Dash Shaw. It's from New York Review Books Comics. Now, as caveats go, um, we recorded at a friend's place in New York City. His computer didn't have the sound off. So there's a lot of pinging going on in the background, which is incoming messages. It sounds like we're in a hotel elevator at some point. I'm sorry. Also, there was construction noise and motorcycles and things like that nearby. Oh, and the two book uh, comics that uh, Dash talks about at the very end of the show are Firebugs by Nino Bulling and Vera Bushwhack by Sig Burwash. And the biggest caveat is I was not at my best for this episode. Um, we had a mid-afternoon weekday recording session, and I think I was just too caught between my, my work self and my, my pod self. They are different personae. There's still a big gill show that goes on throughout, but I just... I was I was in a wrong frame of mind, and you're going to hear that. And I apologize. I apologize to you guys. I apologize to Dash for just not having my A game, uh, especially to talk about a book that is is just so amazing. So I apologize. Uh, here's Dash's bio. Dash Shaw is the author of several graphic novels, including Bottomless Belly Button and Discipline, published by New York Review Comics in 2021 and named one of the best graphic novels of that, graphic novels of that year by the New York Times. He has written and directed two animated feature films, the most recent of which, Crypto Zoo, won the Sundance Film Festival's Next Innovator Prize and was nominated for the John Cassavetes Award at the, in, at the Independent Spirit Awards. He lives in Richmond, Virginia. And now, the 2024 Virtual Memories Conversation with Dash Shaw. So where did Blurry begin oh, for you? Oh, we're going to dive right into it. We may it. as well. Um, well, I had done a short story... Um, that was in an issue of, Na of Fanographics Anthology Now, um, issue number two, where um, a character kind of tells a story inside of, inside of a story. I'd done that a couple of times. And I liked that because then we see how the first person reacts to the story. And now it's someone who moves to New Mexico and they don't want to um, buy a car. Mm -hmm. They want to just ride their bicycle everywhere. Um, but uh, in this town, you'd seem very strange if you didn't own a car. Um, so, and he wants to meet a girl online. Um, but if, he find, if, they, if someone finds out that he um, doesn't have a car, they don't want to go out with him. So he kind of concocts a scheme to um, not reveal that he doesn't have a car <laughs> by meeting in like a particular location. And, yeah. um, and then... At some point in the story, she says, oh, I haven't been on honest with you. Like, I, I don't have a driver's license because of this incident. And she, she can't drive. Yeah. And it, so it goes into her story. So I had that kind of ruminating. And then um, I was also thinking about very um, uh, microscopic moments of doubt between two very similar things. Um, like you go to the... If you go to the grocery store and you have to choose between two different kinds of beans or two different brands of the same kind of bean. Yeah. And there's that moment. Um, and there's all these kind of different versions of doubt. Um, so I kind of arrived at, um, this, the first man who his brother's getting married and texts him what to wear to the wedding. And he goes to a store and he has to choose between two very similar dress shirts and um it's a uh, uh you know part of part of i mean i could blab about it for a long time you probably bring more up but the 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 choosing between two very similar things and um a story inside of a story i think were the first couple of seeds but then it kind of you know you work on these forever and and they kind of you combine different ideas yeah. into into one thing you when did you realize it was evolving 
your note, with your first comic being like 800 pages, I'm used to you going long. But, uh, you know, when was the, the realization that this was a significant well, book, book. Um, bo- that bottomless book wasn't my first book. It was just the I'm first, sorry, the first book I people, read. Of yours, uh, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people cared about um, the uh, the. I like a decompressed storytelling style. I feel like uh, pe- that readers like it. Manga is extremely popular, um, so I feel like this is the the pace of of t- uh, the co- sense of controlled time that I enjoy. And, you know, bottomless, I would do, I didn't do any page numbers in it to kind of encourage people just to keep yeah. moving through it. Um, and in this one, there's no chapter breaks. So ideally blurry, you read in, you know, one or two sittings. And um, that's part of the trip of it is that you, go into all of these people and then you exit all of the people. And, um, so the length, you know, the number of pages is kind of part of the, um, part of the reading experience that I enjoy. Like, you know, I I love drifting classroom and that's like hundreds of pages of, of kids running and screaming. And there's a section in kind of the very middle of drifting classroom where it's like a puddle on a ground and it's just a few pages of this puddle spreading. And, um, it's just, um, people, people have different kinds of way of ways of controlling time. And I kind of like this one. It, it was one of those in reading it. It was that exact vibe. I was like, I'm trying to find a, a point to put it down. <laughs> I'm not yeah. really. Well, OK, the, the, the person telling the story has changed. This is, you know, the point at which yeah. I'll finally rest my hands for a little bit, come back right. and, and read uh, the second half of it. But were there moments of um, I want to say giving stories enough enough length or where stories started to grow beyond the scope of what you thought they were going to be? You know, with that nested structure that you use throughout of story within story within story. Well, because um, every panel is the same. So- this is sort of a technical. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Also, question. you have a two by two grid for the um, entire book. So I just Pretty thought much, about yeah. the pan. I just thought about what was happening in the panels, mm-hmm. um, not page. I didn't want to do any weird page layouts. Yeah. I just wanted to be in the panels, and so. And so that also meant that I could add things and um, move things around. And so when something felt too long or too short or I need, I could add, I I could very easily edit and and construct it. So that was also, I couldn't serialize the book because I was kind of drawing things in the first half to match things that I discovered in the second half. Um, I was going to ask, so the, I like, the art uh, grows tighter. The art grows fuller and, and, and more detailed, it seems, in the second half. And I, I wondered, oh. now I, I, that feels more like something where you were, you were looking back and forth through it. So, well, sorry a lot to, of the uh, last things I drew were in the first half. Yeah. To, to, so, um, to set everything but I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I'm certainly not the most consistent um, artist with my hand. The characters look distinct. They all look like who they're supposed to look like. I, I, <laughs> that's you know, the most important thing. Yeah. To me, that's that's number one. But but tell me about working in that that two by two that you you set up for this. Which again, I now get is also working in terms of of literally the mechanics of making the book compared to the the last book we talked about, Discipline, where things were they were floating. Uh, there there they were pages. Uh, it felt at least um, as opposed to well, panel by that panel. That one. Um, you know, pe- I'm sure other guests have talked about the Chester Brown method of drawing each panel separately. Yeah. Um, and uh, for discipline, I drew each element separately. So um, the text floats, everything floats. And that was inspired by Civil War era illustration that doesn't have panel borders that right. I probably talked about on the on, when I was last year. But um the, so there's kind of a quietness, and it just meant that I could, uh, if I felt like drawing trees that day, I would just draw a bunch of trees, and I could kind of collage the pages together. So it was even more um, malleable, 
Um, also, because there aren't word balloons, I would find pieces of text from actual diary entries to stick in um, to, to the pages. So everything was very, very malleable. Um, but it was, uh, uh, um, and it, I, that book took a very long time and um, I did this book asked for something different, um, a different way of editing. Um, so they look different, but they both came out of different ways of um, being able to make changes and adjustments to the whole to the whole story. That's a problem with a lot of um, comics is that they're serialized and then when they're collected, um, they don't make any sense. The first halfs or the first half is bad, and they didn't know what they were doing, and and they kind of it got better as it went, and um, and you reversed so. that. <laughs> I'm trying to make something that is, you know, good from beginning to end and, and, um, that, uh, it involves, it involves a, a different approach for me. Mm -hmm. Did you have this in your head while you were working on discipline or was it a, I just need some time and a different mode. I need to get away from how I was working before. I started it in the middle. I quit discipline a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a bad idea. Um, for a bunch of different reasons. So somewhere in the middle of that, I focused on this. Um, and, uh, you know, so many things happened. Um, there are projects that take a long time. And, um, I think that the, the, I'm sure the doubt of working on discipline somehow rolled into this because I was filled with self doubt on that book, um, and kind of questioning, I, every little aspect of the book, you mm -hmm. know, and also making movies is like that too, where there's lots of micro decisions that you can fixate on, um, that don't necessarily, um, change. They probably don't change the audience's experience that much, but you can still go back and forth on whether you should use take three or take four of one scene, yeah. you know, and you can really, and I'll, bolt up awake at night four years later thinking why did I you know choose take three <laughs> which it plays into the four. plays yeah. into blurry at, at one point there was a not a meet cute but a, a meet rage I guess where where characters are arguing over a, a cup oh yeah and a, a, a scene in a documentary yeah and a, it's a you know I've been to those uh, test screenings, test screenings or, yeah. for documentaries they're especially interesting because you see just how much they're changing what people will perceive as being true. Yeah. Um, and someone's whole life can be um, cut out of a documentary and, and they feel like they won't, weren't part of an important story or something just to keep the pace of the I have movie. a, a you know, whole sure comics know. thing <laughs> to share with you about that when okay. we're off mic at some point, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell you that part later. So, the uh, yeah, the doubt of discipline and... Um, yeah, the films, different things going on while working on this. You know, doing I did Clue in 2019, a, a comic miniseries that IDW was my my mainstream monthly comic miniseries, and uh, I think that that helped me with everything because I had to make something very quickly. I did it on a monthly deadline. Yeah. Um. So it'd be like I need Scarlet's story. You know, mm -hmm. and I just pull it out of my ass that day because I had to have it done. Yeah. Um, and that helped me um, to kind of realize, well, there's a lot, you know, you can get a lot done if you just force yourself to do it and not get stuck. I had wondered if the two by two grid was part of that, giving yourself parameters. But it seems like there was more going on for you in terms of, of using that structure. I did pick up some drawing things from doing Clue, like for, you know, there were a lot of like game board kind of image, <laughs> game yeah. board designs in Clue. And so that kind of led me to use more um, circle and square templates for word balloons. And th I, 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 I kind of used, used some things from Clue in, in this. Yeah, how do you feel your arts, I don't want to say progressing, changing? You know, are there aspects of Blurry you couldn't have done when you were starting out or even a few years into your career? That's a really good question. Uh, um, because thematically, it feels like the book of somebody who is 
we'll say middle-aged, not, not that I want to oh, project great. exactly, but, but somebody who's looking at turning points and what <laughs> middle-aged means. But again, I am projecting. We'll, we'll put it in those terms. Um, but it does feel like a more mature book in, in certain ways. And I don't know if there's aspects of storytelling, art making, et cetera, that you, you don't feel that you feel you grew into. Wow. Or is that something um, for the critics to talk yeah, about? Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to, I wonder what the, I'm w wondering what the first thing that would pop into my head would be. Um, I was, a, uh, you know, I always liked comics. I never went out of a period of not wanting to do comics. So mm -hmm. I've been doing comics since I could draw. I'm very, very young. Um, so they they, you know, the comics I drew when I was 10 were, are, were different than the comics that I drew when I was 20 and, and different when I was 30. And, um, so I, I try, I don't, um, from the inside, I, it can be very tough yeah, to, to see. I guess never, I would say I try not to think about it, but that's not really true. I just don't even know what kind of thoughts I would have about it. It would just be, um, and I also have a bad memory. And so now sometimes I'll remember the book I did about something as opposed to the thing. Yeah, the making. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But we didn't actually talk about your comics upbringing when we, we talked in 2021. You know, where did comics start? You mentioned drawing at 10, but, you know, when did comics start for you and how did it, you know, how, how did you grow into comics, I guess? Yeah, the um, I've said I, I did... I, I've talked about this so much that I, I maybe I didn't bring it up because... I, I grew up in a very comics friendly household. My dad read comics. They were around, um, you know, he liked, um, he liked the spirit. They were like the print in my childhood home, the prints on the wall where there was like a Will Eisner print, uh, um, uh, uh, um, what's his name? Um, Edward Gorey, Edward Gorey was huge. Um, you know, he was a, he was very hip to, uh, um, uh, he had, he had Fantastic Planet on a VHS that I saw very, very early as a kid. And he, he collect, he got in, he knew kind of exploitation movies. And, um, so I didn't have a lot of cartoons had an older sibling, but I had a dad. Um, and I think, you know, something that I've later kind of thought about is that, cartooning peers of mine i think comics was associated with something that their parents didn't like yeah and so it had a bit of a titillating um rebellion rebellion yeah. quality or that the you know the imagery of this horror comic was and and uh, you know i think um uh, ben mara does a great job of um kind of providing that to a reader and f making objects that feel um like they should be hidden um but uh um you know if your dad is into them they aren't they aren't so transgressive yeah. you know so i didn't um and he was into pretty you know weird violent stuff and so the the comics that i that were my dad never got into the Japanese comics, and I was the right age when all of the the Japanese comics were yeah. exploding. Um, but he would, you know, he would drive me to Otakon and drop me off, I think, and go to anime conventions. Yeah, that's usually a question of what do your folks think of you going into comics. That's what I, I I ask people. It sounds like they were your your dad would at least have been understanding. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and my mom was a play therapist, which I feel like. Uh, um, is some part of this too yeah <laughs> so as blurry was evolving how do you how do you keep track of what you're doing you know when it comes to to organizing the the whole let's say matryoshka uh uh russian doll you know uh structure of it all you know was there a degree of i've got to stick the landing on this and i, I think i know where it, it all finishes but you know trying to make each one of those stories substantial in and of itself as opposed to, to just a contributor to, to something that comes later well how much of a challenge was storytelling throughout this book i guess is a shorter way um, of putting it. <laughs> you know again because i could move things around it it it's, it's 
I, it was a process of discovery and getting things into alignment. And um, I wanted I wanted it to feel a, a have that feeling that it's rambling and you don't know where it, it's going to go. And you're like, what? We're, fo we're, we're following this other person now? Oh, the person's still choosing between the ice cream flavors yeah. and <laughs> flipping your and corn. Then, but ideally, around the middle point when it starts bending back. So it, so it feels like a run on, like automatic writing, basically. And then I hope it feels fun when it starts bending back in the latter half. And then you're like, oh, this is all about this yeah. this was all about this and so that the latter half would be enjoyable because you're um i'm delivering on uh, something that started off rambling is kind of looping back into a feeling of um synchronicity or yeah. a rhyme there's you there's usually there's rhymes between the first and the second half of people's people's stories and um, and I think that comics, honestly, is is pre if if I do my job and I draw the characters differently enough, which was uh, a big part of it, and making sure that they are they each do have their own thing going on, then it's not confusing. Yeah. Um, so some of the last things I did in the book were just putting patterns on people's shirts so that you yeah. could track <laughs> them and. Um, uh, trying to put a detail in a, lo in a location so that you don't get confused, um, but not too much detail, you know, kind of so that's still legible. And um, yeah. In terms of just finding the visual mode, you know, sticking with that sort of clear line, getting away from the, the hatching of the, the, you know, dominated discipline and, and going with washes and and you know an easier line style um i did again it kind of grew it it grew out of the story and so i do think that for whatever my hand can do not that i'm like a i'm i'm definitely not a fantastic chameleon but i'm trying to draw in a way that's appropriate to the story mm -hmm. and so I thought that drawing in this pared down w way with the characters would make it legible. Um, and I had uh, maybe somewhere around the beginning of this, I started to get more into the New Yorker gag cartoonist kind of guys. Yeah. Um, and especially, uh, you know, Garrett Price, lots of people love White Boy, but he did... Um, he did a bunch of gag comics and they're not even particular they're they're not that funny he wasn't a very funny um gag writer but he was a great artist of um of humans in in mundane places um and a bunch of them were collected into a book called drawing room only that you can get on ebay for 20 cents um so the non-white boy stuff by Garrett Price and also the washes by Abner Dean, I really loved. Um, I think the washes also help the clarification of all of tracking everything. And then something I figured out with Bottomless Belly Button is if you spend years drawing a book, um, it's good to coat it all in one color. Um, it kind of helps disguise the um, idiosyncrasies in the drawings. So, uh, you know, I did a, a very, very dark blue ink for everything. Um, and that was also a bit inspired by a great book that I should say Joe Kessler, who co-designed the cover of this book with me and, and helped on a, a lot on the production on Blurry. Um, I always really loved his uh, breakdown press designs. And um, um, he did a book called Fukushima Devilfish that is in a dark blue ink that I, that I referenced a lot when we were working on Blurry. You don't have to answer, answer, but tell me about working with New York Review Comics. I'm so used to the, the Fanta and Drawn and Quarterly guys. I love sitting down yeah. with New York Review uh, books because they send me all the, the, the great comics that they're doing, both the reprints and, and mm -hmm. some of the new stuff. But what's your experience been like with a, with a, a different sort of publisher than, than we're, you know? Well, um, 
I want, I like it that they only put out a few books in a year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not, my mental health cannot take um, what is probably required of me um, uh, hyping myself up constantly on the internet. I have a hard time. I do the best I can. I do what m my it, it's personality. It's killing all of us. It's, I can it's... I can do what my personality allows. I'm at the edge of my personality on mm -hmm. that. Um, so the book, you know, this book, came, it came out a year after it could have come out, you know, because I have to fit onto their slate. Um, but uh, the that also kind of helps me because I have to be patient and not think about participating in um, the world. I just have to work on the book and the books come out whenever. Um, they gave me lots of notes, which I also like. I, when I was younger, I didn't have this attitude, but being through some film screenings, you find you, you can, I just want to know the notes yeah. so that when it comes out, um, I have hammered it through. I, I've done lots of books that have spelling errors and factual errors. I've done it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I'm ready to not do it anymore. I want to get the the paper. I want the proofs back from. I want to approve the proofs from the printer. There's always some tiny little thing that has to be changed. You know, if so, they do all of these slow boring things that I really appreciate. Um, so yeah, I I um, I'm I I want to do all of the boring stuff. Yeah. So when we talked in, in 21, your, your movie had come out a few months before the, the book uh, that we were doing, Discipline. Now that the movie's had a couple of years, and you're, you're in New York because there was a, a screening uh, last night, I think. How's the, how's the film experience comparing to the, the comics experience for you in terms of longevity, storytelling? What, what are you taking from, you know, seeing the, the afterlife of a, a movie like this? The afterlife of it. Um, well, how different is it, I guess, than, you know, putting a book out or tell me your impressions, whatever's going uh, on in your head about, you know, they're very, very different. Um, you know, at this at this point, the the movies have grown. And so they're kind of, they're they're not as large as other people's movies in terms of their scale, but they. They're now social, my social projects, meaning they involve other people. Yeah. Um, and my books are my anti-social projects, you know. In terms of collaboration um, with, with everybody else in the I, movie, you mean? Or, yeah, you know, for so like I can wake up and I can work on my comic and it's just me and my space and um, I can generate things. I don't need to explain to people what I'm doing. And then after lunch, I'll work on um, film stuff, which is usually explaining to other people what I'm doing um, uh, yeah. or asking artists to contribute and adjust, making adjustments. And we have a, our little team in Richmond, Virginia, working on the next one. Um, so the, and about it having come out, I mean, the the. It, they're very books are internal and uh, I like that and they're silent and I like that and the we did tons of drive you know drive-in screenings for crypto zoo because it came out during COVID and Sundance set all of this oh, stuff yeah. up stuff up and it play I've got to travel the world and see all the animation festivals and all the funky things and I've gotten to the the animated movies got have allowed me to have all of these other kinds of experiences. Um, comics also uh, um, have has taken me places, but uh, they. I, it's it's there they're different other, ecosystems. There kind of some, yeah. uh, they're definitely in different ecosystems. Yeah. yeah. How much of an overlap is it? Do, do you find people who've seen CryptoZoo who have no idea that you're making books too? I don't know. I mean, I've. N I've found that they less crossover than someone would think. Yes, yeah, so I wondered whether there's there's no, different. its own distinct audience. Uh, That's what maybe. it seems like. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's and the my movies are definitely like independent film audience, mm-hmm. you know, and they play well at film festivals because that's where people want to see a weird animated movie, and then you know when they have the theatrical release, they, it just sort of confuses people. Yeah. Um, and uh, the no, I don't. I think some people, I you know, I just don't. I don't know. It it definitely seems like a different. Yeah, it's very, very yeah. few people yeah. um, uh, cross over in my mind. I wasn't um, sure if you'd meet people who, oh, I saw your movie, and then I realized you were this cartoonist. And, and, it's happened you know. a little bit, but also the books are quite different from each other. Sure. Um, so if I, had a, if I had a game plan to acquire um, fans and, ha- and build my empire, I would have done things a lot differently. You know, I think there's some, there's being consistent is great for that, and I and I would be happy to be consistent. It just hasn't turned out that way. Um, so I spend more time thinking about just how to um, make money to be able to afford to keep going than than uh, yeah. other things. <laughs> You're happy with blurry. And and you know the the, the final final version. Uh, uh, I, totally, yeah. yeah. Very very happy with it. It really felt on um, that. It it felt like I had played a video game for very very long, and I had gotten I found a bonus level ah, or something. Yeah, you know, and uh, that was very exciting. Um, I'll say one of the. Interesting things to me, given what I do with this whole sitting down with two microphones and somebody else vibe, a number of the stories that that emanate in the book begin because somebody asks somebody a question. Mm -hmm. It's less of a, let me tell you about the time this happened and more, Mm -hmm. why did you end up doing this? Well, you know, then then Mm -hmm. stories start to unfold. That conversational sense, I guess, uh, that, that sense of dialogue, how much... How much of that was coming into your your comics writing versus you know writing for a film or where did dialogue begin for you and and you know that sense of two people can actually something can emerge from two people that isn't necessarily you know as good as a dialogue line. yeah well the uh, man that's hard to I know it's a um, weird one to ask but you know where you know, how stories come out of two people interacting um, well I had done i i i don't know if this really answers your question but it's just sort of popped into my head but somewhere around um bottomless and body world and these different kind of comics i was doing i realized that naturalist i thought naturalistic dialogue is just another form of stylization that's something that sounds real there are isn't nothing is real on the comics page and so there are kinds of things that you can do that sound like it is real um i don't know if that's helpful but because i tried things with um you know with the book new school the dialogue is kind of based on or inspired by very like almost like jack kirby kind of comics where people are speaking with exclamation point endings and then discipline obviously that's found Dial found language. So the when it came to blurry, I was like, I want it to feel like you're hearing something and you don't know what is important. Part of quote unquote realistic dialogue is that you don't know what is important in it. People yeah. will kind of meander to get to their point. Um, so that has to be a very deliberate decision, obviously, of course, in a comic because you have to... Um, Guide the reader. Work all, yeah, yeah, guide the reader, pick all, find the spacing of the word balloons and, and really hammer it out. Um, so you have to kind of go out of your way to be a bit more loquacious than you would be if you were doing a play or a podcast. <laughs> um, at least that's how it seemed to me. I don't, um, does that kind of answer you? Yeah, in a sense. Okay. It's one of those, to me, it's just the the... the the charming aspect of it, in a sense, I hate charming as a term, but we'll run with it, um, is the sense that it's it's 
the thing that emerges between people, that it's yes. not some person, you know, just sitting there staring at a wall and having a reverie and going into a big memory. Yes. Uh, so much of it is, is, you know, what comes from talking to someone else. Yeah. Someone to, um, who read this, uh, I don't, it, it said that it felt like, especially after COVID, my book felt, he said, my, my book felt like being in a crowd of people again. Yeah. Um, I thought that was great. Yeah, that's it's very um, much. That's a great, uh, great way to describe it. Um, yeah, because it it is burrowing in on this one moment, but um, it's moving through a lot of people in a, I hope, exciting way. Now you bring up doubt, and and that you know, the the decision between two almost imperceptible, imperceptibly different things, but. The turning points are a big aspect. Some people are making momentous decisions in the the, the course of the book. Um, this is the middle aged guy thing again. That sense of turning points, that sense of those decisions that you you know are irrevocable. Um, you, you deep in that world <laughs> at this point, or are you you're still in the? Well, no, I'm saving a lot of possibilities for myself. You know. Um, Tell me about turning points in your your life in the you know Rilkean or or whatever uh, sense. But. The only the only thing <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna uh, well I think part of the style of the book is that someone will make a choice but it will have um, it won't arrive at the um, one to one conclusion. Right. Um, as the stories ripple out. So I tried to have it be more fluid than, um, because like, for example, um, and again, that's a form of stylization, I guess, like, you know, the case on the, the a character in the story, he, um, he's in these drawing classes and he says, but he's a, he was like, he says, I was a sculpture major, but for some reason I, took a bunch of drawing classes. Um, and I feel like that is part of the style of the book. Humans know that you don't necessarily major in what you end up being interested in. You find some other class that you end up being involved in that's outside your major, especially in art school. Um, so he made a choice, but he kind of arrived at something that was only adjacent to the choice. And a lot of the characters in the book will do that. They'll be like, well, they they choose this one thing, but it ends up resulting in this thing because of whatever activity they had to do to arrive at that choice. Yeah. Um, so uh, the... The externalities can, can get to us, too. That's not just the individual choices, but the life right. that, you know, comes out yeah. of nowhere at you. I mean, my joke is I'm a lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry, but... I have no science background or pharmaceutical experience or regulatory or government affairs or anything like that. I just kind of ended up in this this job, which is part of why I do this by day or by by evening so I can stay sane. But, yeah, we end up in lives we didn't exactly plan um, or we make decisions that, you know, don't that seem momentous. But, you know, the rest of life has other plans for us. Again, projecting the middle age guy thing. Um, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm middle aged. I don't feel. I, yeah, no, no, maybe uh, uh, you're an artist. I'm, 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 I'm the uh, you know I, I'm the old man in the room. It's okay. But you know, I thought of something when you mentioned Garrett Price earlier. Have you ever had that New Yorker vibe or the gag panel bug? Uh, you know what's funny is um, for a while, um, Jane, who is now my wife, she. She was an assistant to a New Yorker cartoonist, and so she would be invited to some of the New Yorker gag cartoonist parties, and I would go. And it was a very, um, a lot of them at that time, I don't, you know, they were kind of like stand up comedian type people that got into drawing comics. I, I've been um, told, uh, years ago, I was told I needed to come to the, the Chinese restaurant where they all met. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I, I'm not sitting in a room with a bunch of gag cartoons. <laughs> that, that They're is, very funny people. Yeah. And when I, when I first moved to New York, um, the cartooning scene was so different because there were people that were doing things for the alt-weeklies. Sure. Yeah. So they were funny people. Um, 
and they were kind of odd characters themselves. I mean, I know that the cartoonists, everyone's an odd person when you get to know them, but um, I I lucked out because kind of the the I wanted even in college I kind of wanted to do things like what I'm doing now. Yeah, it changed a bit, but um, the uh, yeah. I don't know. I've never, I've just never had that. That I, I think of guys like uh, Carl Stevens and Everett Glenn and people who panel to panel strip mm-hmm. guys who also found you know that they could do gag comics uh, mm-hmm. or gag panels for for the the magazine. A gag I just, comic is hard. I yeah. I yeah. I don't know. Like one of my, my first one, I mean, we have a Roz Chaz card mm-hmm. in front of me, but Roz connected me with Sam Gross many, many mm-hmm. years ago, uh, the late Sam Gross. And uh, just I, sitting down with somebody who was operating at that level for like 50 plus years, I'm like, that's mm-hmm. a different mindset completely. That's. Mm-hmm. You know. But tell me, you, you said you had a different idea of what you wanted to do in comics when you were in college. Oh, I'm, I just, I didn't have, I, I think... I, again, kind of like you're saying, you play the. Yeah, I was a little surprised that to arrive at this because I don't really think that if you had asked me, well, what kind of comics you would do at um, my age now, it would be blurry. I don't. I don't know. I. I would have been happy. Uh, I still, honestly, um, like the clue doing clue helped me because still somehow in the back of my head comics are um monthly uh the pamphlets that were genre stories and clue was good because i can draw in a way that i feel like is appropriate to clue Mm -hmm. um i don't think i could draw in a way that's very appropriate to um to a lot of the comics out there i don't know it's a bit of a it'd be a bit of a stretch but um i I'm but I guess, happy with how it how it turned out. It was that college self thinking Spider Man or or you know the the whole superhero world, or were you already kind of indie by the time? Definitely you were? indie. Yeah. You know, my dream at my dream at sixteen was uh to be published by Fantagraphics and um cool. um you know, that was that was it. When I think of those, look, what you're describing with Clue reminds me of Roger Langridge, one of my, my mm-hmm. all-time faves and a, a past guest, who, when Boom announced that he was going to be the cartoonist for The Muppet Show, I mm-hmm. thought there is no more perfect combination out mm-hmm. there of, of, you know, IP and a guy who could perfectly, perfectly capture not just the visuals, but, you know, the whole um, the whole vibe, the vaudeville thing um so those rare instances where you know that sort of stuff does make absolutely perfect sense and and leads to really great comics but but yeah the indie versus you know we'll say big two or big three or whatever it is that whole publishing vibe where it's more of an assembly line has got to be a well a choice you made very young i guess uh, i would have been happy to do anything sure sure yeah if they had hired me sure are there other (laughs) storytelling genres you're you're looking at or interested in or you know man i would love to do a story about x or is that jinxing everything when it comes to yeah i don't know, want to <laughs> no, say, don't, don't do that. but i got things cooking yeah you mentioned finishing the book over a year ago um no i mean that it could something have come out a year like earlier, that yeah right, i think but. yeah just You've been working on something since yeah so, okay you're not going to talk about it in the slightest right i don't think i should no, yeah because i'm don't. i'll change it it'll look bad and yeah, I found that early on in the show, people would talk about the the project they were working on next, and I'd revisit them four or five years later. Nothing to do with whatever just yeah. came out. Had absolutely nothing to do with what they were talking about in you know twenty fifteen or sixteen. Mm-hmm. But um, but talk about the the animation. Talk about working on what are you what have you learned from the previous projects that feeds into how you're working on a new one. Without again going into what you're working on exactly, are there aspects that you've are you getting better, I guess, at, at working on these things? Is it more management than story? Or, um, Well, I can say that uh, the, the main character in the new one is, uh, a, is voiced by a kid, ten, a 10-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. Um, she's in pretty much every frame of the movie. Um, and I was a, 
Uh, kind of inspired by the John and Faith Hubley animations and and the particularly the voice acting in that. When I had done High School Sinking, I originally thought I didn't think I would get known actors in it, so I tried to write something where it'd be voiced by kids. Yeah. So I, the thought would do, but I changed. You know, I changed, um, and I it, that's not how that one turned out. But I still thought that there was something, especially in those Hubley cartoons, with that particular voice acting that's extremely um, powerful. It feels like a documentary um, voice being paired with a very artificial um, world. So we got a casting director to find the the kid, and um, we found her. She lives outside Philadelphia, and um, um, it was a whole journey. We had to you know, audition tons of kids and, um, it was so cool. And, um, we recorded her and we kind of are constructing the movie around her perspective. And she's, because I, uh, you know, I always, of course I love the Miyazaki movies, but part of my problem with them was that I always felt like the kid was too kind of milk toast in the center of it. I hmm. thought yeah. that it should seem like a, a kid who might actually be crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah. So we found, we found one had nice. to deal with it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I tell people that she's my Klaus Kinski. <laughs> That's, um, did you know that was what you were looking for coming out of your, your last couple of projects? Or is it a, uh, I don't well, know what the process one, is like. For, each yeah. one has been different. I mean, the, the, this story asked for that. And um, the, the, yeah, the, you kind of put things together and and you pair it, it I think that something that's similar with everything that I do is they're basically collages even in ask, the movies do you feel you're building towards something or do you feel things develop organically I guess that's that's what I'm wondering <laughs> building or organically or is there the collage the, a split between those two uh, well to I the kind of art that I like is collage art, you know, like Rene Magritte, um, Max Ernst said Magritte is um, collages painted entirely by hand. And I, th- and when he, and I, when I read that quote, it's like a light yeah. bulb went off in my head. It made sense to me mm-hmm. because he, by executing them in a similar way, meaning there's a surface sheen over something that is a cloud, like an apple in front of a face, right? It's yeah. a famous one, but there, um, all, all that's to say that the, that you're kind of pairing things together to equal third surprising things. A plus B equals, holy shit, Z or whatever, you know. So whether that's um, pairing a particular score with an image or or some sometimes with the movies, they're, they're elements painted, drawn by different people that you're trying to bring in alignment and you're kind of hoping that uh, you know, there, there's, I like it when the difference, there's something poetic about the differences of things being as heightened as their similarities. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and comics obviously are, are kind of, I've said it a bajillion times, but they're collages that have kind of rules that, that you begin at the upper left hand corner and you end at the lower right. And there's an accepted way of reading a collage um uh about it i i definitely don't have the whole there they are organically arrived at and i try to be open to um yeah intuition or mistakes and uh, do you think of working in live action or no it would seem that animation would be not just because of your drawing but the Again, the collage, the ability to put it together after the fact instead of having to have everything in place for the, yeah. the actors. When I, you know, the first, uh, even when I was in college, I liked, I always, in high school, I liked a zone of animation that was related to comics. Mm-hmm. That's like limited animation, like the Charlie Brown Christmas special and Speed Racer and there, and Akira was, you know, um, made by a cartoonist based on his comic and, um, I liked that mode. It made a lot of sense to me and it related to independent cinema, kind of like less is more um, mode. So that was, it was never a dream to work at Pixar, Cartoon Network, or 
uh, um, the direct, direct yeah. live action and yeah. um, the, it was always that other thing. And then, and then I was so lucky that very early in my um, um, early to mid twenties, I did a series for IFC channel, um, the Unclothed Man that ran between movies on the on the IFC channel. And so that was some outside force saying, you, you, uh, you're onto something. There is a connection between what you're doing and independent um, cinema. And from there, I went to the Sundance uh, Sundance Labs. And that was like 2010 ish. Um, and that was when I was kind of deep into um, trying to make these things. So I've only made a couple, but that's still, you know, not many people are making independent animated it's movies. And more than a lot of people um, have done. And they've each taken a long time. So in the, the, the third one, when it comes out, it'll, it'll be approximately five years between. But, between crypto zoo so they each will have taken about five years to make um and uh i, I wish i could i i kind of i would like to do i would like to get it down to four years mm -hmm. yeah that's the, <laughs> i was gonna ask whether the, there's any not efficiencies but just things you realize like if well, i had really financing if i had like if they were making more money then yeah, suddenly really the, everything would be uh, i would everything would be different around them but the um but also, you know, I, I people laugh when I say this, but I don't think people actually want one of my movies every other year. Like the, you know, that the, they're understand. pretty their own. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're. I think a it's few, an event for a year. You know, it's okay. There, I, there's, there's. There. Listen, people didn't want a Star Wars movie every year, as it turned out. So right. you know, they they thought they were mining yeah. something and realized audiences they like to wait. They like to to you know. Yeah. Admittedly, with you, yeah, four years would be better than five, but but you know, I understand. Um, it's a weird question, but you know, given that we talked in twenty one, um, I think we were in the vaccine era, but not traveling at that point. What was the the COVID era and beyond for you in terms of of my pandemic? Was that lots of people around me died, and it was horrible. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's been interesting to see how p people talk about, cartoonists talk about it, because um, to me it was about death. Yeah, most of them didn't have losses um, like this. I'm so sorry for bringing no, it up no, like that. Okay. Then. But yeah. It's okay. Or yeah, some... it seems... Uh, um, uh, we remember like being in New York, I'm in New Jersey, but you know, for us it was the... Because this was one of the epicenters early, it was that sense of like the, the 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 cooler trucks and everything else sitting outside. And my friends in New York would have all these horror stories of mm -hmm. the ambulances at all hours. But you know what what it meant. You know, I guess in the the aftermath. You know, beyond what the what the coverage was. I guess I'm cutting you off. I apologize. I, I don't know if it's something you want to. No, the. Um... I think, uh, and I had a, you know, I had a little girl um, to do it. So you had to tell like your little four-year-old girl not to um, go near other kids on the playground. And mm -hmm. um, I thought it was, uh, it was terrible. Yeah. You mentioned how blurry, how a reader felt blurry was, was not an antidote, but, but that sense of, of overcoming social distancing. Do you, do you think that was playing into it as you were making the book? Well, or do you not think of those as motivations? I was also, um, I don't, you know, it's, it's sort of, I've only COVID. thought about it. I'd only kind of thought about it after, but the, the, um, uh, I started discipline. I thought uh, discipline, when I started discipline and crypto zoo, um, Obama was president and I thought Hillary Clinton was going to be the next president. You know, it was a different kind of yeah. vibe. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, definitely um, uh, living in Richmond um, during uh, uh, some people might think that it made me want to work on this Quaker Civil War thing uh, when all the monuments were going down and all of that, all this stuff there. But um, and it did feel, of course, that the city was addressing something that had been unaddressed for many, many years. Um, 
But the the truth is, I you know I didn't I we I was not anxious to be at the drawing board on a on a downer of a it was it was not fun to work on you know I, I did not find it inspiring, um it was just a bummer, the, so I think blurry um part of the mission with blurry is that um <laughs> sounds sounds a little funny but the idea is that there's nothing that's too funny and there's nothing that's too dramatic that I was aiming for a mode almost like an ambient album where it's like you are in (laughs) you're in the zone and Mm -hmm. it's there's something kind of pleasing about it but you there's very few actual jokes and there's very few actual dramatic things happening throughout the book Um, you're just plugged in and you're in it and I think that it helped that that was a healthy thing to work on. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, it must, it must've been because I, you know, I kind of was working on it when I didn't want, when I had decided that the other projects were not, um, were that I should abandon them. Yeah. I got you. I don't want to say it's a comics as therapy uh, vibe, but there is a degree of, of storytelling at least Mm -hmm. in, in different modes. I've definitely figured out that, um, you know, my, my mind is best, best when it's on the drawings board, drawing board and when, you know, uh, it'll go, um, go, yeah, that it goes on the page as opposed to staying stuck in your head. That That and, um, just the, the, I'll, I'll crash hard if, if I usually, usually, uh, if I'm feeling down, I'll, I'll realize, oh, this actually has to do with the fact that I haven't drawn for a while and instead I've been doing this other thing. You know? So I'll hit you with the question that I, I probably hit you with last time, but I don't know if you're prepared for it. What have you been reading? What have I been reading? Comics, prose, poems, wow, I whatever. Have to, I have to... Um, Did you bring anything with you for the trip? You know? um, or is there something you've read recently that just knocked your socks off that you had to... to Voiced off on other people. Oh, I have a good comic that I read. Yeah. Um, I really liked Firebugs. Don't know it. Who's that it by? Drawn and Quarterly put out. I don't remember the artist's name. I'll look it up. Um, yeah, I think it's their first book that I've read. Um, and it kind of, it, it kind of, the drawings are spectacular it kind of feels almost like a, a Seiichi Hayashi comic. Um, and uh, yeah, Drawn and Quarterly put it out. I, I think uh, some some other publisher originally did a Risograph edition, but I, I, I just got... I also liked another D&Q book that I thought was much kind of... It was very different than what the cover suggested, which was, it was like Vera Bushwhack. Mm-hmm. Do you know that no, one? No, no, I don't. Um, I think I'm saying the title right. It, uh, I'll correct but, it after if we um, have to. But. Those two were g- great. Um, other comics. Um, yeah, well, there's two. I'm willing to take that. That's, that's you know, um, I'm always looking for recommendations and, and the next thing to read, so. The problem is everything that pops into my head, I'm like, oh, I didn't, I actually didn't like that one. Yeah, that's always a thing for me is the, let's just pretend that's, that's. Don't want to say that one thing. It's okay. We'll leave off with, with these ones. So, but Dash, thanks so much for, I'm glad we get to do this in person instead of just doing a remote like last time. And I'm I'm glad you came up for a, a screening in New York, but thank you so much for, for sitting down and for just, for putting in everything that goes into blurry. because. thanks. I know you, you, th- you. I know you say there's, there's, you know, no drama, no laughs, or at least that it's, it's my. Uh-huh. There's a lot in this book. I, I got a lot from reading this book. Oh and enjoyed yeah, the I didn't hell mean. Out of it. Uh, I didn't no, no, mean. You were knocking it, knocking it. Um, but, yeah. I meant that the the the, heightened the, the yeah. There's yeah. it's more kind of like a zone, yeah. a zone of a mode. And that's right um, up my alley. Maybe for just where great. I am right now. But this was a wonderful book for me. So. Thanks. Thanks so much. Did you, oh, did you ever read any of the Natalia Ginsburg books? No, you know her? no, I know they're, they're again New York Review uh, yeah, stuff. Yeah, they did, but in. other publishers have put her out, and and uh, they have a kind of story uh, style where it's hopping around in different 
it's kind of about other people and it's dipping into other people's lives in an interesting way. It's different than my book, but the, the, um, I recommend those. Always looking for more. So Dash, thanks so much for coming. Thank on. you. And that was Dash Shaw. Go get Blurry from New York Review Comics. It's an absolutely and deceptively fantastic graphic novel. Um, I've told you enough about it, and you got uh, some of that vibe from the the conversation itself. And go check out Dash's other books and his animated films. Uh, it's all at his website, dashshaw.net. That's D-A-S-H-S-H-A-W dot net. I got to go check out that Clue comic book that he did because uh, it it sounds a lot different than what I'm used to from Dash and, and something I'd love to see. You should also check out or watch Crypto Zoo, the, the animated film we talked about. I bought that um, on Apple TV so I could stream it whenever uh, back in 2021. I'm not sure where or if it's streaming free, but you can go buy it, either D uh, DVD or Blu-ray or buy the streaming version. Do yourself a favor. Check that one out. Now, Dash is on Instagram at Dash underscore Shaw. Uh, but as he mentioned, chasing the social media thing is not great for him. Uh, but he does post excerpts from these books and other projects there. So it is worth checking out. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories show by telling other people about it. Just let them know there's this podcast comes out every week with really interesting conversations with fascinating creative people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it or who you'd like to hear me record with or, or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or whatever you think I should check out and turn listeners on to. And you can do that by sending me an email, a uh, postcard or letter. I put my mailing address at the bottom of the, uh, the newsletter I send out twice a week. Um, or by leaving a message on my Google voice number. That's 973-869-869. 9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. So go longer than that, you'll get cut off. Just call back and leave another message. And let me know if it'd be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show, because you might have something interesting to share with listeners, but I'd never run something like that without the, the speaker's permission. Now, if you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, sure, I spend money on tolls and gas and parking and all that stuff to do these, but my day job treats me pretty well, and I am going to ask you guys to, to help fund the book that I'm making at the end of this year. But in the meantime, help people, help institutions. Um, th there's a lot you can do for people in need if you go through, like, GoFundMe or, or Crowdfunder, Indiegogo, Patreon, Kickstarter, all those things. There, there are people who need help making medical bills or, or rent or car payments or veterinary bills or getting an artistic project going. Um, a few dollars might make a difference in their lives. So, you know, try and give. With institutions, I give to my local food bank and World Central Kitchen every month, but there are other things I give occasionally. I make targeted election contributions, but I'm a lobbyist, so that's part of my job. Um, but Planned Parenthood, Women's Choice, Freedom Funds, Election Funds, there are all sorts of things you can do to, to try to help make a better world. So I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show.
And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.